distracting. I don't like to look at myself when I'm talking. I don't know, but we're live right now. Just so you okay. Know. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Here. Um, no, I can't because I'd have to put you down in the audience or something. Um, or ladies and gentlemen, welcome. <laughs> this is Jenny, Jenny Norton. Hi. And um, Jenny runs a Seattle dog or dog on Seattle Rat dog rescue, right? Yep. Well, why don't you introduce yourself? How are you? Um, you you're in Seattle. I know you. And um, yeah, let's get into it. So, uh, Well, I am the founder and director of Dog on Seattle Rescue. We're an all breed rescue, um, but a lot of large breed dogs. Um, been uh, Got our 501c3 back in 2017. I was in rescue before that, working with other organizations. Mm. Um, we're foster based. We work with a lot of trainers in the greater Seattle uh, area, a lot of balance trainers as well, which is a little different than some rescues. Um, we do a high volume of adoptions. Uh, we did about a thousand last year. We've probably done about 4,000 dogs since uh, inception. Um, we, the, but they are, it's not churn and burn. All of our dogs are in foster care for at least a couple of weeks while we get to know them. And we're pretty um, careful about where our dogs end up and then provide support once they go to their new homes, including like working with trainers, people in our rescue, um, if needed. Uh, Are you, I, um, do you have your, your phone that you can share the live stream? So other people that oh. are in your um, audience. And so if, if anybody has rescue stories or anything that they, we, they can watch it live as well. Yeah, absolutely. Hold up. Let me grab my cell phone real quick. Okay. I will put you, go grab your cell phone and I'll, I'll wait here for a second and then I'll chat with the audience. And then when you come back, I'll put you back on the, oh, there you are. Oh no. It's it was cool. right I mean, there. <laughs> You never I put know it, I'm streaming it on my Bow Wow Bill page Okay, perfect. and we're streaming on YouTube too, you guys. So if you're not, if you're not subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do so. Um, I'm trying to get a thousand subscribers there at least. And I got like 308. So Bow Wow Bill YouTube channel, we're streaming there live. And uh, also my personal Facebook page, which if you haven't noticed, I'm not on Facebook anymore. I'm just doing these live streams. Um, but I got a bunch of these lined up. And you guys, I started a Patreon page. It is my goal uh, to be a content creator full time to do this for a living. And so if you like the stuff that I put out, please consider supporting me at Patreon. I'll put a link to my uh, Patreon page in the comments down below here in a little bit um, or after the fact, if you're watching this, uh, check that out. And uh, if you like what I do, I want to. I want to introduce the world to people like Jenny um, that are boots on the ground working every single day and um, and also teaching other people that might be new in the industry. But I also want to take this to another level where we, I actually travel and introduce people um, at their location, um, talk about my experiences uh, at the Naples Post School, as well as other other training um, facilities and and um, experts and all that stuff. So I think that we can do this. And I ask that uh, I ask your help in, in doing so. So uh, I just awesome. heard it on my page and in our foster and volunteer group. We've got a large community of fosters and volunteers as well. So hopefully some, some of them are watching. You know, and I think that we can do much better with it by these animals and for these animals if we cooperate mm -hmm. instead of compete. And we have a pretty big uh, indicator that something's gone a little wrong euthanized every single year, you know? And I think that... I don't know. We can we can touch into that here in a little bit, but you you place over a thousand dogs in a year, huh? Last year, yeah. The last two years have been big with COVID. Um, it'll be interesting to see how things shake out this year, just because there's people that got dogs that don't want them anymore that they're being returned. Adoptions are a lot slower. I feel like everybody who wanted a dog in the past couple of years got one. Um, so you know, there's ebbs and flows. Um, right now, it's particularly bad. Uh, shelters are all full, even up here where we don't usually have that um, being the case. And I feel like we need to do more. And then I look at our numbers and we've got 110 dogs in the rescue right now. That's a lot of dogs to manage and, and take care of. So um, we really can't take on more dogs, but that doesn't keep the request, you know, the help request from coming in. So just, what, what, go ahead, Jenny, sorry. Oh, no, just like on a daily basis. It's just constant. And we just always take in as, you know, one goes out and we try to take one in. And that's just how we chug along. 
Yeah. It's always a moving, um, ebb and flow, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, um, and especially now, right. A lot of people seize the opportunity when we had those lockdowns to get a dog and there was a COVID puppy was a term. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, a lot of people are getting back to their normal lives and having a dog is a lot of responsibility and people don't realize that until it's they're, they're met face to face with it. And, um, so what, what, how long ago did you start this rescue? Uh, we got our 501c3 in January, 2017. So this is our fifth year. This is our that. seventh year of operation or sixth year of operation, I believe. Okay. And I worked in rescue before that as well. So what made you, what made you want to start a rescue? Uh, well, I've always loved animals. Um, I've grown up with dogs, had dogs as an adult, you know, when, went off to college, got a dog, got another one, um, and worked in wildlife rehabilitation. And then, you know, I started volunteering with a rescue and kind of saw how things worked and what some of the shortcomings were and what, um, you know, where, where the dogs were failing, why that was happening. And, um, I, my real life job was kind of business development, consulting, how do you make things better processes better? And I was applying that to my work, um, with this rescue and, uh, you know, I didn't see eye to eye on how a lot of the things were done. And I guess at some point I just thought, why don't I just do this myself? Um, right. you want something I, done right. Yeah, I can do this. And it was kind of one of those conversations with my husband at the time, you know, when we met, I wasn't involved in dog rescue, you know, and then all of a sudden he's married to the crazy dog lady that's bringing home random, you know, dogs every other day or whatever. So, but we had that conversation and I had his support. And so I did, um, I guess the, the long story short, um, when I was in grad school at university of Washington, we had to build a community. Okay. It was our capstone requirement, build a community online and about something, whatever. And I had proposed the topic, uh, why you should adopt a dog and that this website was going to be all about adoption versus, you know, at the time that was my idea. I actually don't buy adopt, into Don't shop. Yeah. Yeah. I don't actually buy into that to be honest anymore. Um, but, uh, ironically, but, um, but nevertheless my professor was like well that's really depressing nobody's ever going to come back more than once like that's not going to work so i actually built my community around like dog friendly seattle resources for seattle dog owners where you could take your dog what kind of events there were whether it was like dog diving or a bar where dogs were allowed in and kind of crowdsourced information and built a facebook page and a you know twitter account and all the social channels and it was really successful and people were totally into it and they were sharing pictures of them with their dogs doing different things. And it was called dog on Seattle. Um, so when I started the rescue, I was like, well, I've already got this like presence online and have made all these connections with people in different, you know, spaces. So sorry guys, but this is now a dog rescue. <laughs> you can stay here for content if you want, but it's going to look a little different. And that actually helped me a lot, like launching into the space. I had the rescue experience, but I had some, connections already in the community places that were willing to host us for like adoption events back when we did those and um and it was kind of like a soft transition um and we i wanted to make rescue keeping what that advice in mind that was told to me so long ago i wanted to make rescue more of a positive place and a supportive place versus uh you know you know i think there's a lot of people shaming in rescue that happens and um, especially by trainers, especially by trainers, you know, by trainers, by rescues, by people, by just by, um, that's just why we're general. talking. That's why we're here talking and why we're recording yeah. it is so we can maybe figure out some solutions, you know, hey, but buddy. you can't do rescue without those people, your adopters, your volunteers, your fosters, if they're not invested and keep coming back for more then you're not going to stick around. And I think there's a lot of rescues that just come and go because they don't have that buy-in. They don't have that network. They don't have the relationships um, that kind of are necessary to, to have staying power. Yeah, um, okay. And so well, that's where we try to differentiate ourselves. Like I think in our community, a lot of the people have been, you know, since the beginning, they have friendships, they know, you know, they share their successes and failures. They do things outside of just with the dogs as well. 
Um, so I, that's important to me. Yeah, I got the mailman or somebody in the driveway just in case my dogs go crazy, just FYI. But uh, that's so cool. And you know what? I've also been, well, one of the things that I always ask people is, um, what do you say to somebody who's getting into the dog industry because they say they, they don't like people, right? Because I hear that a lot. And so what do you say? Like if you hear somebody, I work with dogs because I don't like people. Yeah, I mean... If you're a dog person, you can probably relate to that like a little bit. I mean, I feel like I can relate to that a little bit, but you have to like some people. You got to be able to work with dogs. Some don't people. don't give you the the donations, man. They don't give you the yeah. credit cards. They don't, you know, they don't pay my salary. And and I work with people primarily, man. You know, because I'm a person. Right? That's actually something that I've had to learn and work on myself a lot. Um, I so I feel like I've always had kind of as I've worked with dogs hands-on, I've fostered like 250 dogs, a lot of bitey dogs, a lot of, you know, challenging dogs. And it kind of came girl. naturally to me, you know, and I've, I've taken as much information as I can from these different places and gone to these seminars and done this and that, and it, but it's come kind of naturally. And, um, but working with people and showing them how to do that, because we can't hire a trainer every time a dog is leash reactive or, you know, has separation anxiety or whatever. Um, learning how to teach other people how to, help their own dogs to, you know, teach our fosters to fish, so to speak, or whatever. That's been like a journey for me and I'm still working on it. But like I, on a weekly basis, probably meet like three or four fosters um, and work hands on with their dogs and trying to teach them how, man, don't know, um, how to um, help their dogs. And so how to explain things, how to like handle different personalities, how to not come, you know, how to come across like effectively. I don't know. That's, there's a total art to it. And some trainers are, Really how to label at, the situation properly too, right? Yeah. Just, like, look, dude, he might be being a little pushy or he's a little insecure or, right? Um, mm -hmm. All that, all the language that you use. And I've noticed that some trainers that are really great with their dogs are not as great with communicating that to like adopters or, or whoever they're working with. And some trainers are really great at that piece of it. And I think that that can differentiate like a good trainer versus a not so great trainer because if you can't effectively convey the information to the owner so that they can kind of absorb it and replicate it, then, you know, it doesn't really matter what you can do with their dog. Well, and it's, it translates to that staying power that you were talking about earlier, you know, yeah. or is power building that relationship. And it's, and it's based on trust. Uh, the cornerstone of all relationships is, is that trust, Right. You trust me and then trust the situations they'll put you in as a dog trainer and eventually trust yourself in the real world. Uh, a good teacher becomes progressively unnecessary um, as as you go along here. But it's also you work with so many different dogs, Matt, 250 dogs personally fostered by your by you. Yeah. By the way, I really liked that explanation about trust that you had with Gina. I'm going to use that in explaining because sometimes people want to know why we do certain things. And when you give them a big picture kind of explanation and make it about trust, it's like easier than making it about, no, the dog has to follow you because, blah, 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 you know, it kind of it feels compulsory. better. Yeah. You yeah. don't want a compulsory, man. Like imagine how you felt in compulsory school. Like there is a time that behavior is going to be met head on. You know, if your dog's being rude or being insistent and they're doing something that needs to stop right then and there, then that boundary is definitely defined. And it's not always being that way. But there's a time that we have to recognize, just like Gina did, that this dog is kind of expanding in his awareness in that space. And as that awareness expands, so does that receptivity of of being able to be taught. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's it is to be able to recognize that. And I tell people like this is a science and an art. And just like you're saying, like I, I learned from teachers, but a lot of this stuff comes naturally. And I tell people, hi, sweetie. Um, my wife just came into the room. So um, I tell people some of the, the children that I see working with my clients have more talent than my colleagues that I see. Right. And so and that's why I want to talk to people and I'm putting it out there, man. I want to talk to new trainers, too. Mm -hmm. So if you're a new trainer, you know, just like Gina, I want to talk to you if you're okay. And I, I promise I'll be, <laughs> I'll be nice, but you know, let's talk about this because I, I want to, I want to, um, I want to cooperate. I want to set this world better. I want to help these dogs. And ideally that's, that's the overall goal that we're all trying to do here. And, um, 
Yeah, I think that we can, man. I think that these problems are created by human beings and so we can solve them and there's ways to do it. Well, you're when you're having these conversations, you're having them with people who care to have them, if that makes sense. It's like, you know, you can tell someone's invested in being in showing up in being good in uh, and understand it as a science and an art because they care to learn more, do more, whatever. The rest of the people, you know, that are just there's other people, too, um, that, that really, you know, they're just set in what they're doing. That's what they're doing. And, you know, there's no expansion of the they don't care to learn more or participate in in conversations like this um, or really at all, you know, outside mm -hmm. of their outside of their their box, their MO. Well, and I can, I appreciate people like that too, because they teach me patience and they teach, <laughs> I mean, but it's also like, I think that, like I was saying, cooperation, giving is the way to be. And I like to serve others. And I, and I understand that we all have different motivations. I also understand that there's personality disorders in this world. I also know that there's evil in this world and there's psychopathy, there's antisocial personalities. I was reading this, this, um, autobiography panzam carl panzam have you heard that or heard of it uh -uh, i haven't it's like a true i mean he's a, the only autobiography by a serial killer oh okay 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 jordan I peterson who's a, i'm a big fan of his as well that he recommended that and i i read it and it's just i mean there is a spectrum of of human personalities and you definitely we not and especially me i don't appeal to everybody and i do not seek everybody to be my client um and and that's it too dude how do we recognize and qualify people because we don't want dogs going into the hands of people that should really shouldn't have them and i know that it's not the i believe the vast majority of people are good you know and uh but you see sometimes that there's people that I guess just don't have the the where or they just don't want to understand the relationship on on the depth that I do. I guess I don't know or that some people do. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I it I see. I'm sure you know anyone that works with dogs probably. But if you're seeking out a relationship with a trainer, you're invested in the relationship with your dog. I see a lot of people that aren't invested in the relationship with dog at all. And then mm -hmm. worse, that's some of it. You know, they don't know, they don't have the skills or they don't care to know or have the skills to make anything better. Um, then there's like the neglect, which, you know, really sucks. There's a 39 pound Malinois at Tacoma Humane right now that bit the kid in the house. Now this child was literally trying to throw the dog out the window when this was happening and it wasn't that bad of a bite and the dog has scars all over himself. And now he's got this bite history. So Tacoma humane won't even consider adopting him out, even though nice dog, uh, never in two years, never had any other issues. And the kid's trying to throw the dog out a window, you know, and I know there are stories that can be made up about rescue dogs and excuses that we make and all that, but sometimes it's just a really, shitty situation you better believe it um and you know and then so i anyway, i'm working on that but um i went out with Posados one year out here where i live and we went to underserved areas to give out dog blankets and yeah and that was probably 2008 and um and i remember seeing this litter of puppies that was just so em em emaciated and we ended up taking like talking them into a lot surrendering the mom and puppies to us and we um, but I remember there was another dog there and I can't do that anymore, man. I just, it, it pulls out my heartstrings and I try to, I try to affect change in a different way with the education aspect, because, you know, when you see that stuff and you've seen, I'm pretty sure you've seen some pretty, pretty ugly stuff as well. We have to focus on, I believe, you know, the, the, the optimistic outcome, the, the, the happy endings, right? Yeah. Or else you just would totally burn out. And it, sometimes you have to put up that wall a little bit and understand you, you can't say yes to every dog. You can't, can't help every dog. All, man. And you still got to be able to sleep at night, um, you know, or else you can't, you can't do it. So. Yeah. There has to be a degree of separation because just like you said, there's some people that don't care. There's literally some people that don't care about those dogs either. Right. And there, there's like, I mean, whatever we can get into that, but I, but, um, I think that it, it, 
because you're you're part of the solution right you're finding good homes for these dogs you're getting them out of situations but just like people message me all the time they send me pictures of a dog in a horrible situation and want me to save them and i can't do anything for them you know and um we have to focus on what we can do and the success stories and you know being aware that we have to take care of ourselves too and know that like i was saying earlier this is 24 7 gig man yep it really is what do you recommend like somebody's new in rescue and i hear people they dream about starting a dog rescue oh i hear it all the time oh my gosh you have the dream job if i had (laughs) <laughs> I would quit my job and I would just run a rescue and have a hundred dogs. And I'm like, okay, a, that's not how it works. Like you can have a hundred dogs if you want, but they're not going to go anywhere and they can't all be. And da, da, da. But it's, you know, and, and then, Oh, this is your dream job. Okay. Well you want to know what the hours are and how people treat you and how people talk to you and what they have to say about you. And, Cause there's an element of it's personal and you know, it's personal when you get to people's animals and, Man, it is hard it's sometimes breaking that fourth wall, right? Oh yeah, of, of separation of because now you're in that family unit and you're part of that family story or, or whatever. And um, yeah, I had a lady come to my home the other day. Was doing an evaluation. She sur- wanted to surrender her dog to the rescue. Honestly, most people when they're surrendering their dogs, for the most part, they're pretty like reasonable. They might feel sad. It might be a bad circumstance, whatever. Maybe I'm, you know, in my mind judging them, but I try to keep it very professional. And this lady was just like, I've never had someone be so rude to me. Like she was really rude. And like, she even like was pulling out of my driveway and going to leave with the dog. She came early. I told her I needed 10 minutes. I was feeding my baby (laughs) and she started yelling at me. And then her dog was crying in the back. And she's like, look at my dog. And I'm like, yeah, I can see your dog is pretty stressed out right now. And it was so awkward. And I was just trying to keep it together so that I could take this baby's dog and have her go on her way because she needed to focus on herself. And um, I just remember feeling so disoriented afterwards. And it's like draining, right? Like I needed to take like a time out after like that interaction with this person. It was like very toxic. And like, you need to just kind of have some space after that and then i remember i got the vet records a few days later from her vet and she had like redacted all this stuff so i reached out to the vet and got a copy of the records from the vet directly and it was like basically the vet's accounting of this woman being totally nuts and how they she was fired as a client and she had been swearing at people and like behaving so crazy and i'm like well that's a little validating at least it's not just me you know like (laughs) <laughs> but like that is like the kind of stuff that you deal with. It's not all like taking care of cute puppies, you know, like you have to deal with people too. Um, and, you know, fosters and handholding and adopters that don't follow instructions and, blah, 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 and, and just make- a- ask holes. Ask holes. Yeah. They don't yeah. they ask for help and then they don't do what you say. <laughs> oh my gosh. I've never heard that term, but that's a good ask one. All right. Oh, what was the other one? Dictum. <laughs> The person who's acting like a dick and then claims to be the victim. A, dict- a dictum. dictum. That's good. I, I like those. Don't be I an mean, asshole and don't be a dictum, ladies and yeah. gentlemen. Well, and you no. will deal with both of those in rescue and it's not all puppies and unicorns and Mando, no, out. And training um, dogs and grooming dogs and walking poop, dogs. Lots of poop. So lots much poop. Of, and not not just the, the, the firm. No, no. Diarrhea. Yeah. Diarrhea. Horrible. I've had, I, we want to go into some of those stories. I've got some good ones, but I mean, it's, a, it's not, it's like people see the, oh, you know, the transformation and the puppy. That's my dream life. <laughs> That's my dream life, man. To yeah. shit from every dream life is having people call you at two in the morning, like verbally abuse you and cleaning out diarrhea crates in the freezing cold in the middle of the night because your With dog, a dog is like howling next to you. Getting bit, you know, <laughs> like feeling going to the there. hospital. I had a bad, I had a bad bite from a Bouvier and it got, they thought my bone was infected. Mm-hmm. And so they almost, I almost had to be in the hospital on IV antibiotics for a week. Like I couldn't leave the, And I'm just like, you gotta be kidding me. Like people don't. And not only that, but the PTSD. And that's what I talked to Gina about is like, there is a certain amount of PTSD that we need to come to terms with as professionals, especially with hands-on dogs and especially getting bit 
I mean, it's a psychosomatic response that was you were bit by an apex predator. I mean, it's it's something that is real and and um, you know accumulation of years and years of this definitely has an effect, and and we need to come together and, and talk about it. I think, and um, also that mental health awareness. And just so everybody knows out there, we uh, with my other dog trainers, we have a BSC scale. It's called a bat shit crazy. <laughs> And so I'll be like, hey, dude, I got a BSC lady just called me ba- a, a BSC 10. <laughs> Which is oh, like, God. That shit crazy 10. I'm going to use for that. a dog trainer, right? <laughs> I have an entire folder in my Gmail called Crazy People, and I file like emails into that folder. And I am going to write a book one day. Um, I love writing, but I kind never have time for it. I'm writing, I'm going to write a book. It's going to be called So You Want to Run a Dog Rescue. And it's going to be about what dog rescue actually entails, including some of the very funny and crazy uh, stories that I have had in my days. And I'm sure they'll just continue to add up, but, uh, but yeah, it's it, all the material. I already have the material for like a many hundred page book. I've got to like tone it down, you know? Um, Volume. But yeah, I've got, Volume I've one. had some bad bites too. I had surgery on my finger from one. I can't really use this finger very well. This one, it doesn't mm-hmm. straighten, doesn't bend all the way. And this is an important one. Um, I had a bite that got infected to the bone also. I didn't have to go to the hospital, but they were worried about, um, about. Well, I didn't either, luckily. And also, like, I used to be pretty fearless dealing with dogs that wanted to eat me, which gives you a certain Mm -hmm. kind of, like, you need that. If you're going to deal with those dogs, you can't be afraid of them, right? And I've Mm -hmm. noticed myself in the last two years since becoming a mom that sometimes I get prickly when I didn't used to get prickly before, and it might be because I've gotten bit. I thought maybe it was because of like the hormones and being a parent. I, I don't know, but I just have felt a little bit more, not with like normal dogs, but with dogs that you probably should be a little bit more on mm-hmm. edge about. Um, and so I, I worry about that if I'm going to like, if this is my new normal or if I'm going to get that confidence back, it's not like a lack of confidence, I think. But when you can feel like in your skin, you know, like, this yeah prickly thing. dude like it like yeah. you literally feel the hair on the back of your neck stand up yeah and i didn't used to really get that i really didn't used to get that and then i've so. had it i've had it with some dogs and deep deep growls man and boom and i'm just like oh crap here it comes and i feel it like just this psychosomatic response dude that's just real and then i had i have i've had to say no to a big aggressive great dane um before my wife got sick I, and then this uh cane corso that scared the shit out of me and i'm just like dude that's dog scared the shit out of me like i want to get the hell out of this room yeah right now <laughs> and true. and people were like really and i'm like yeah dude later i gotta pass i'm like i can't i'm out <laughs> i'm like here's all your money <laughs> like take it i don't care like I I got that feeling about a Malamute that we took in about a month and a half ago that was going to a foster with Malamute experience that really like petitioned us to help this dog and talked me into taking him. He was rescue only for like being fearful, but he didn't have a bite history that we knew of. But of course, he's coming out of the shelter. So who freaking knows? And this is a big Mm -hmm. dog. I don't really like work with the northern breed kind of dogs they're, they're not my jam and uh and he came off transport um denise says i think it's because you're listening to the hairs on your back and the neck more it's not that you're yeah sorry he came on transport the malamute sorry. came on transport yeah he came off transport and he had this look in his eyes he was very quiet very still like i'd almost rather barking and lunging at me and i'm like i just got i'm like i feel like i shouldn't even send this dog to this foster i don't know this foster i mean yeah he has breed experience oh, but I've awesome, never him before. and <laughs> that's a funny comment um uh and i just had like this all the spidey Didn't sense and you know what nothing happened i went really slow with him it was fine but like i was totally like i never would have felt that way before and um so yeah. And then I kept checking in with him like every day, like, how's it going? How's it going? Like, you know, <laughs> it was really, uh, they're like, great. It's going great. We love, love, love. I was like, okay, <laughs> no news is good news, <laughs> man. You know, yeah, exactly. 
but that's what happens. I think that it, it just like energetic residue is a real thing. And that's why you're saying the boundaries are important because even waking up, like first thing that you're on is, is thinking about your clients. And we got a lot of people joining us. We almost, um, if you guys type in where in the world you're watching this from, I think it's really cool. We see people from all over the world when we, when we share this, even if you're not watching this live, even if you're watching it after the fact, please type in the comments, where in the world are you? And if anybody has a rescue out there too, um, so what do you Who tell people? Have a rescue? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you tell people that started rescue? What do you tell? I mean, I mean, first off, it's freaking hard work, man. Like it is, and it's twenty four seven gig. You're gonna be treated like shit. You're I have going... done some mentoring with uh, people that have started rescues. Marie, you probably know Marie with the Pacific Northwest Catalog. Absolutely. Group. Yeah, I talked to her a lot when she was getting started. Just kind of. The everything from just how you set up your nonprofit to who your transports are to how do you screen applications? What do you do with the heartworm positive dog? Um, there's a gal named Ashley Jacobs who's down in Newport Hills that I used to work with um, for Hawaii dogs that just started a rescue. I mean, I think a couple pieces of advice like don't Never bite know. off more than hi, Astrid. <laughs> um, don't bite off more than you can chew especially in the beginning, like you don't want to get in over your head um, mm. because at the end of the day, it's going to fall on you. You can't. With the number of dogs or with the type of dogs or both? Both. I mean, I my rule is if it's not a dog that I'm comfortable taking into my home personally and managing or dealing with, I'm not going to bring it into the rescue because shit hits the fan and it will be at your house. Like, I mean, I have, I have really good, I have boarding options. I have a kennel that I can use in an emergency. I have things that can come into place if needed, but it, ultimately it's your responsibility. If you're not willing to put your hands on the dog, work with the dog and, and feel like you can't ask somebody else to do that. Amen. Um, that's, that's my, f and we work with a lot of good trainers and there are dogs that I don't want in my house. Um, and thankfully someone else will work with them. But if I am not even comfortable working with the dog, I'm not taking that dog on. Right. And then um, that's what uh, Dave has a good, this Dave Cochran um, is a man, but over in Baltimore, I will not take a dog in for rescues for training without a dedicated foster ahead of time too. And that's what's we, good about having that network, man. Yeah, we have, so we have different trainers that we work with. Some of them will foster the dog so they don't necessarily need a plan and they want to see it through to adoption because they want to set the adopters up for success. And other trainers that we work with say, no, I'll give you this much time, you know, three, four weeks, whatever. And then the dog needs somewhere else to go. So in those cases, we really do have to have a plan in advance and you got to be confident that the dog's going to get to a point where it's ready to go to a foster home. I mean, by and large, the majority of dogs we take into the rescue are not dogs that need trainers, professional trainers. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing a thousand adoptions a year, right? right? A lot of puppies, a lot of easygoing dogs, a lot of normal dogs. But we do try to help some of the more special needs cases when we can. And for those dogs, you kind of have to be more deliberate about what you're doing. So, well, and there's also breed specific rescues too that right. a lot of these dogs go to. We're talking, you know, that the higher maintenance breeds or the, mm -hmm. um, but you were even saying that you, um, um, I've had to euthanize more fosters than I've had to rehome. Dang. That's oh, rough. that's see, and maybe you're like their last stop. Uh, a lot of trainers are, yeah. and especially yeah. I could see Dave. And you know what? I am too, man. I've used to nice some dogs that I've been like this dog. I do not feel comfortable. I do not trust this dog one bit. And I have to be honest. I owe that, you know, even if it means this dog's life. Yeah, but at least you gave it a shot. And I mean, we've euthanized dogs before. I do not believe that every dog, you know, is should be adopted at all i do believe that it's worth it giving them a fair shot if i have a dog that doesn't you know that hasn't had a fair shot maybe they've only gone to like a himza or something and they've got you know some minor stuff going on or maybe they have a bite but it's a it's a circumstantial like this malinois that i was just talking about you know um malinois or malamute Mal the Malinois that I was talking about that's said to Coin Humane, the 39. Oh, the, yeah, the bad, the really sick. Like okay. that kind of situation. You're like, you know, like, I don't think that's throwing dog's the your fucking dog out the window. Yeah. Um, yes. But I mean, if you give the dog a shot and they, you know, they're not tr safe or trustworthy, like good luck. And also, it's one thing to send your dog to training when it has an owner and the owner is invested. It's another thing to try to find a home for a dog 
even after training that has this history and to get somebody to like eyes wide open, take that on is a lot more challenging than, you know, there's a lot of dogs that need homes. Why does somebody want to take on a dog with this, you know, history yeah. and this and that. So when we it's have a hundreds whole of them that challenge. don't have that problem. Right. 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 Even if you did train them, you know, even if they're mostly, mostly good. And then the dogs that will bite their own people like that pit bull video that you showed, I'm like, no. Was that dirt nap? Was that your comment, Dirt Nap? Mm-hmm. I would agree fully too, man. That was a serious ass bite. And if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, I don't know what part of the video, but it was on the last video. And, well, you said uh, she, like Hope probably tried to rehome the dog. I'm like, I hope not, because that's just going to happen again. I mean, no, that's scary, you know? That absolutely is scary. And that's why I like these cameras, dude. If I can see, like, just as a fly on the wall, what happened. And be able to thin slice it and slow mo and just kind of—I mean, it, it, it's so helpful. Um, so if you guys like, if you ever do some uh, video conferencing or, or um, Skype sessions, like videotape the behavior if you can, and videotape it in a in a like a third party where you're not affecting the behavior. Um, does that make sense? You know, um, and I want to read this comment here. Uh, JD Von Bear says, uh, make sure you all like and comment. It helps with the algorithm on YouTube and pushes bills up in people's feeds. So if on YouTube, on Facebook, like, comment, share, everything helps you guys. And uh, we'll be doing a lot more of these and, and getting into these conversations and, um, you know, hopefully finding some solutions for people uh, where they can continue the conversation in their own lives and, apply the knowledge and, and better their life and better their relationship. So we got people in Connecticut. We got Linda land, <laughs> uh, Rainier, Washington, uh, Astrid. I love the Amanita mascaras in the, the profile picture and uh, watching from Unicaw do amazing things. Beth says, absolutely. And then she is a 5013 C. So she does, she can take um, donations and uh, you know, and that's tax uh, writable. Damn right, dude. And that what a what a what a dark thing to say. I mean, yeah, if maybe you, if you haven't. Maybe. I mean, I, I agree with you. And like I said, I don't. I'm not one to pass on. You know, the buck stops here, kind of thing. Like, if it's not adoptable, you know, I get it. But I'm I hate to do it, and I'm there with them when it happens. If we don't have someone else to be there with them, but but it doesn't feel good. No, dude. And but doing what's right doesn't always feel good. Yeah. You know what? Amen. And that's where Dave, I mean, that's, it's so true, dude. And sometimes the truth is brutal. I think in rescue, more rescues should also be cognizant of the fact that when you put dogs out that are, I'm not talking about have some bad behaviors, but like are dangerous, um, aren't stable, like truly unstable can be, uh, dangerous dogs you're doing a really big disservice to the rescue community in general, because that negative experience that's going to happen, not when, not if, but when that happens, how many people are going to be impacted by that? How many people will have their opinions changed by that? Especially when you get into some of the breeds, like how many children are going to be affected for the rest of their life. Yeah. And not even talking about the physical harm, like that, you know, there's 20 people right there that will now, have that negative opinion about a rescue dog or a pit bull okay. or a German shepherd or whatever it is that will, they'll not change their minds ever. Um, and so, you and know, just have confirmation bias and any dog or anything that they see that confirms that what they believe yep. there, they will. Yep. And I think it's them. really important with the power breeds, you know, like I, you know, people will expect like, um, to some extent, people expect dog reactive, um, dog aggressive pities. But when you get the ones that are sketchy with people, it's like, that's not really what the breed is supposed to be like. And there are so many that aren't that way. Like where, what are we doing? You know? So when I have like owner surrenders with pities, like that have had people aggression, it's a no, because I, I just, those dogs, they're not, that's not what the breed is supposed to be like right now. Um, not right now ever, you know, and, and there's so many that aren't that way, literally well, the, millions in the shelters, you know, and it's skewed. The numbers are skewed, man. I look at the rescue pages and not only that, but they're straight up lying about what this dog breed is a lot of I, not, I mean, unethical, I think, uh, rescues or whatever, trying to, trying to get these dogs, just like what you're saying, man, trying it's to, it's a Weimariner. 
He's a, I've seen it be like a golden retriever, something cross. And I'm like, dude, yeah. that I had a, I had a lady come <laughs> here. I had a lady come here. I don't know who, who, who she got it from, but out here, she, uh, gave me, came out with a, a lab mix and it was the biggest red nose pit bull I've ever seen in my life. And That's it was, funny. I was like, this is not a lab mix. This is, I'm sorry. You've been lied to. And, but this is a, a high maintenance dog. And, and the dog was fricking. I had an X pen with my puppies in it and the dog fricking just laser focused on those puppies and like was dragging the lady over to those puppies. And I'm like, this, this ain't good, man. Like uh, not in a good way. Like yeah. I know a good way. No, no, a high, happy wag, like, Oh, puppies yeah. over there. But this was a serious, I want to maybe uh, consume these squeaky things <laughs> over here. You yeah. know, I don't, but it's, and, and that's what I owe my clients is to the truth. And, um, some, some people I see once and never again, but, um, and some people I, I, uh, yeah, that's, but, but it, yeah, but I am not for everyone. No, but that's another reason why I want to do this content where we're talking like, and we're going to reach people that we wouldn't reach in our local area. And, and not only that, but, um, you know, you're going to resound with somebody and, and not only that, but it also gives, provides more um value to the people that actually care and that that actually want to enhance the life and fulfill this animal enhance their life and bring by by bringing in an animal into their life and and that's what i tell people like dogs they should be enhancing our lives right and they should be fun it should be a good time man if we have if we're always managing this animal man dude like you can't live your full self like they say you can't live your full self without like toxic toxicity in your life and i think that that's the same with if you have a toxic relationship with an animal as well i really had to like so since my daughter she's five months now was born uh my doberman hasn't been thrilled you know he's not aggressive with kids at all but he definitely is a little uh you know he's a little baby's emo like dobies are and um and he's just kind of disturbed, you know, and he does things that are really annoying, like eat the diapers, even though he knows damn well not to eat the diapers. Like he's a well-trained dog, but he oh, acts no. out. He's emotional and he acts out and he like does really naughty things and he won't do it when, you know, he'll get caught. He knows better. And I find myself like so frustrated with him and annoyed with him, like because I'm tired and because like I'm like, why aren't you better dog? Like, you know, better than this. And it's like, it, it starts to feel like a toxic relationship, you know? And like, I feel taken advantage of like, Hey, you're living here. I'm feeding you face. And like, why are you doing this to me? You're making my life harder. I'm supposed to like you. And then like, I have I'm like, supposed to like you. you know, Remember I'm, that. I'm, I'm literally, I threatened him to, I told him, I'm like, I'm going to freaking rehome you. I'm going to put you up for adoption. You better start. Like, <laughs> like, I know um, some people, man. I, I have connections. Um, but, uh, but like, and then I realized like, okay, he's probably not getting his needs met. You know, he's not getting the tug and the play and the, I haven't taken him dock diving and, you know, like he's not getting his needs met either. So I, you know, and then I kind of have to come full circle on that and be a little more, you know, I don't know, whatever the word is, but, uh, but it's hard, you know, cause it is a relationship. And especially when you put a lot into the relationship, he's, I've had him for four years, you know, yeah, yeah. I've was, seen videos of you with him. Yeah. And I love him, but man, you're like, and he's jumping over the fence and he's going after rat. I mean, just, <laughs> I call you know. my dogs the preacher's kids. You know, if you ever wanted to get find a good party or whatever, you yeah. go see the preacher's kids and they tell you like they'd always yeah. know how to how to get the worst trouble. And that's what well, I call it's it. hard when you foster and you train and you help these other people to remember to spend time with your own dogs too, like working with them. And um that's probably usually the first thing that goes out the wayside, you know, when thing when time gets crunched. Um so yeah, I'm not perfect like in that regard at all. He says, go fetch me a clean diaper. So no, he goes for like the poopy ones. Like, you know, he gets, in, he opens the diaper pail behind the door. I'm that's closed. You too. I want to introduce you to, because he's a damn good trainer in Baltimore, but he's still a damn good trainer. And, and he's a no nonsense guy too, man. So I'm going to make an yeah. introduction with you too, Dave. And, and after this conversation, just so 
Um, but you know, like that's very deliberate, right? You know, like, I mean, he used to do things like, okay, he gets up on the couch when my mom's not in the room. Cause she knows, he knows that she's the one that has the no couch roll, like at their house. But like, now he'll go put the diaper pail behind a door and he'll go and like, open the door, sneak into the room, open the door. You know, when we're in another room, open the diaper pail, get out the poopy diaper and eat it, you know, make a big mess of it. Like th that's a lot of steps. So to take gnarly. Dog. Will, Your you dogs know? are so gnarly. Yeah. I'm like, and, and then he, he's, you. Listening. Yeah, and then you. he's listening like for us coming, you know, and if, if he hears them coming, you know, he'll run halfway out. You know, it's like very naughty deliberately, you know, I've seen dogs sneak behind me when I'm looking in the mirror, like I've seen them yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, this guy that's in the photo above, he's in heaven now, but I've, I've had, I, I was like, bro, like I'm looking at you right now and you are totally disappointing me right now, dude, because That's I so thought cool. you were my guy. You're my head Yeah, people wolf, like dude. underestimate dogs like emotional capacity or like say they don't feel like certain <laughs> things or whatever. Like, no. My performance dog peed on a client's 10-year-old son today. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Well, you guys, like, I'm sure you've seen or heard of this. Like, we have big homeless problem here and, you know, San Francisco and stuff. Yeah, big I time. mean, I've had a dog lift a leg on a person on the sidewalk before walking down the street. Like, that's a get out of here thing, of course. But, like, that's a that's been – Seattle's hard. Seattle can be hard walking dogs around down there. And a lot of – yeah. Well, that I mean, and, and not only that, but just the sheer number of people here and just that translates to an influx of rescue dogs. Like, and it, I, I keep on thinking about like what Heather Beck was saying about how being, do you ever feel like you're at the bottom of a waterfall? I don't know what that, yeah. I mean, uh, like every day, right? You know, just it's constant, right? And pressure yeah. and That's trying, to come up for, trying to come up for air. Mm-hmm. And trying yeah. to get a breather right and then that's why like heather was like that's why i opened my training facility because i wanted to get on top of the waterfall because in the rescue i felt like i was under it and i was like okay but yeah. i guess in a in a waterfall too like you can be on top of that in a rescue and i think that's what you're doing because you're not all dogs right you're taking the dogs just like you said that you're comfortable with in your house so i think that that's more on top of a waterfall Maybe in the middle or the three quarters up. <laughs> Depends on the day. I mean, I've had to scale back the dogs in my house to a great extent since having a toddler and a baby. I mean, I still take difficult dogs, but they're behind doors. You know, they're not out in the they're they're not out on the couch hanging out. You know, kind of thing. I've learned a lot too. Um, yeah. But no, but it's not me that makes it um, on top of the waterfall. It's all the other people, right? We've got hundreds of people who have fostered, 110 people fostering right now, you know, and don't you have a gala or something? Don't, isn't there a, what? a gala or something? Oh yeah, we do. Well, we haven't had it for two years because of right. COVID. We do winter. Oh, we're going to do that this year, December 3rd. Okay. Um, I'm there. Ballard. That'll be fun. Um, but yeah, no, but it's all these other people that do it, you know, all the other people that foster, um, that make it manageable. And then we have like case managers, you know, Gina said she, uh, case managers, she's one of, you know, a half dozen people that volunteer their time to make this uh, all work. I mean, Beautiful. it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of hours a week that is spent by volunteers, um, you know, coordinating things. So, I mean, I couldn't do that alone. It's not just me. I, but I have, you know, we built it. So, um, yeah, you've done something and, and building a community. Do you think that the U, U of Dub lesson kind of taught you how to do that? Or do you think that because you're doing something right, man? I just know because I see like, um, you know, you do have a very responsive and very active community. And um, um, I mean, I learned, I, learned COVID, I think it's going to get better. Honestly. That program was about um, communication and marketing and digital media. So like yeah, I learned some skills on, you know, in that department. I also worked um, in my family's business for a decade, uh, you know, doing business development, I guess, and like learned work with my dad, um, you know, who taught me a lot of lessons in like running a business. Um, I and think we need more of that in the, in the dog industry. Oh, yeah. I think we need more Fortune 500 like... I don't know how to explain it, but like 
protocols and procedures and how to deal with big problems, you know, and, and um, like we just had this Amazon center that's just, they're building right down or out here in um, Smoky Point. And just to see the massive um, scale of this thing and how many intricate parts are there, right? And that's what these businesses do, man, is that they take these these abstract problems and then they 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 piece them down, they chunk them into manageable solutions and and then they apply it. Do you do you agree? Is or yeah. actually I know what facility you're talking about. Um, my husband works like literally right across the street. You're right, but that's right by the airport. Yep. Up there. Yep. Yeah, I've seen that building going up because I've gone up there occasionally. So I used to work at that business before I when it was in rescue it was my family's business and they relocated up to Arlington and they're right there. Oh, cool. um, so Sounds I've seen that cool. and yeah. I've seen that going up. And yeah, it's like, you know, you, you have a massive problem and you're starting like with the foundation, right? And building it up and there's all these moving parts. And I was thinking about who must be running that, you know, there's so much to do. And that's kind of where a lot of, um, rescues, I think, maybe drop the ball is well, I not think that they don't see... all the moving pieces and parts that you have mm-hmm. to manage. I think we need people fresh industry. that aren't influenced by. I think that we need fresh eyes on the project. Does that make sense? Like we need people that have no clue what they're doing to come in here and do. Like I, I think people are invested because we are. This is an emotional labor of love too, right? And. Um, you know, I think that there needs to be a, a wider scale approach to solving this problem. And I think that that honestly will come ab- apart or about from people like you who have experiences of, you know, applying and, and building this. But it has to be from the ground up, I think. Or yeah, like, oh, I don't works, know. You know. I don't know what the answer is, like long term, 10 years, if I'm still going to be grinding every day like this or if there'll be another way to like make a difference from i don't know um without without the you know 15 hour days kind of situation maybe more consulting or or like you were asking if i've helped other rescues and i don't know i don't know there's definitely a lot that can be done better um and if people had like a handbook maybe when they started you know i think a lot of people just figure it out as they go and you learn from your mistakes um which i did you know i have i still do every day um uh humans are the problem good luck solving that yeah Yeah. philosoph we need philosophy (laughs) majors (laughs) we need well you you know and you're not going to solve we're not going to solve people like i said earlier like the people that either don't have the knowledge or the skills or don't care to have the the interest right the interest they don't have they don't need not only do they not have the knowledge or skills they don't care to have the knowledge or skills they don't care to put in the time or effort minimal as it may be i mean to make things better for their relationship with their dog i mean you even can just say hey like you've got to use a crate and that would solve 99 percent of your problems and they're like i don't want to buy one or i don't want to use one and you're like well all right then so you know what i mean like what are you going to do with that step one you know yeah. that crate well and the other thing an easy example but you know anything right well i was um I was reading on Reddit, there was a, on, um, I think it was just a regular dog thread on Reddit, like a subreddit dogs. And it was about this person that was getting shamed by his family because they wanted to hire a dog trainer. And the, the, the thread was huge. And I never, ever in my life would have thought that people think this way, where it's like, they, why would you want to hire somebody to help you with a relationship that you should be able to form on your own? Or it's like this esoteric thing that you have to figure out on your own through the journey with this dog or listening to that intuitive nudge that this person has that is completely wrong. Like, I don't know, right? Um, yeah, it's... Um, that's a new one for me. People are interesting. Yeah, that's that's nuts. What? Oh, just like that someone could be shamed for that. I mean, I've not heard that before. That's- I didn't either. And I read the whole thread and people like it was a long thread. I have to find it again because I haven't been able to find it. And I remember I went on Clubhouse. There's this club. Do you know Clubhouse? Mm-mm. It's a live audio app where you can go on and talk live to people. And I remember going on Clubhouse and and reading out some of the comments and stuff. And it was just it blew my mind because I've never thought that people would think that way. I thought that people would always view it as something favorable to hire a professional. 
I feel like anytime I go down any comment street, comment feeds or, you know, deep into the armpits of the internet, I am armpits. disappointed <laughs> in humanity. Uh, Dude, I've been disappointed the last two years in humanity. Just I don't want to get started with that, but it's <laughs> I've been it's been an eye opening. Where why do people hire counselors? Yeah, diet coaches, etc. Yeah, but a lot of times it takes a little bit of um, you know, just knowing. Hey, I don't know what I don't know, and some people have too big of an ego to say that. Yeah, I um, always say I know enough to know that I don't know very much. <laughs> And uh, that I'm going to, you know, keep, keep learning on that. And, you know, it's, I enjoy having some of the relationships with trainers that I have, like Gina or, you know, um, Jeffrey or whoever, all the people in the area that I would call friends, because I get to like learn from them all the time. Um, and the dogs teach me a lot, but, you know, having those relationships and, um, and, you know, staying on top of things and reading books and going to seminars and all of that, like, it's that's what I probably love most about um about rescue work personally just I find it very fascinating I'm somebody who likes to learn and um likes to learn new information new skills and so that's like really fun for me that's something I enjoy doing um there I haven't really been able to do that so much lately because there haven't been as many opportunities but it's starting back up now so like Jeffrey just told me about um a seminar that's going to be at um Learburg in Wisconsin this summer that I'm going to try to go to. Who? And oh man, and I it's not go with before it was uh, about um, motivation and the the tests that they do to kind of evaluate a dog's um, learning oh, style. Like it's for like evaluating working breed dogs and stuff. I would recognize the guy's name if you said it, but I hadn't heard of him before. Huh. Um, but that doesn't mean anything. I think he's a big name. I just. I'm not that into the big name trainer people. Um, but like I went to like the Duke Ferguson seminar, the knee popo stuff at, at Sparks. And I've been, I've been to tons of seminars and I love learning stuff. So if you ever have um, hear of any good ones that you think I should check out, let me know. Cause cool. I, we're going to do some here. That. We're going to do nice. some here at the property. And um, I'm locking down a lot of these great interviews. I'll be having another one on Monday. And then on Wednesday we have Calvin Wilbon, Wilbon, joining us understanding dogs mind through survival and comfort i have been in touch with brian bailey uh who's um a green beret in alaska who's lived with the wolves and talks about the hammer aggression we're going to be chatting um ladies and gentlemen michael uh shikoshi, uh, shikoshi uh, will be coming on may 30th 4 p.m pacific standard time uh, aggressivedog.com great guy so so looking forward to that uh, Tyler Mudo will be on on the 23rd at 1 p.m and he's going to be celebrating his birthday on that day the big three nine last day before is over the hill and then we have Pat Stewart uh, I believe next Friday I have Casey coming on I have so many and I, I feel so blessed because I, I have such a wonderful network of dog trainers, been doing this for so long myself, um, that I can tap into to so many people that are living their passions every day. And and now that the world is opening back up, like I haven't been doing these live streams either, man. I've been I've just been hanging out. I've been dealing with my wife uh, and getting her um, double down dog training. Look who it is. Everybody follow double down dog training. Go to the comment section. There's Gina. That was who was on last um the last live stream that I did uh, who we were chatting about. She's one of the uh, case managers for dog on Seattle. Phil, I, mi I mixed, I mixed it up. So I was thinking of Cameron Ford, um, okay. Ford nine for the games thing, but that was actually not the seminar that I was talking about in Wisconsin. That was Michael Ellis. And I know Michael Ellis. I don't know why I forgot his name. Um, oh, Michael Ellis. I would, I have never yeah. met. I would love to. Oh, I met him. I met him. And we hung out and we had a wonderful time, actually, <laughs> Michael Ellis and I. And yeah, Louis. that's the that's the seminar in Wisconsin. I don't know why I was blanking on that. I, I combined the two in my mind because I think uh, Jeffrey is trying to host um, Cameron Ford out here for like a, a working dog kind of evaluation deal or something. Send send stuff and who knows, but I'm sure it'll be fascinating. 
Awesome. Yeah, I love having uh, uh, meeting people, having hands on seminar and watching people work, work dogs. You know, that's valuable. And uh, not only that, but it kind of proves that their application um, is real. You know, so yeah, it's a good uh, burn, right. Hands on. That's how that's kind of how I did it. <laughs> Well, it's a way to go, I think, you know, and I remember having this conversation on Clubhouse with this lady who was purely positive and I asked her how many tra dogs she's trained and she was like three dogs, Oh, and, but she was a pure PhD mm -hmm. and, um, oh, Dawn, I love Dawn and Dawn, my wife. I love my wife too. And after chatting, um, we, she said, uh, maybe I should get my hands on more dogs and, and and live, not read as many books <laughs> and i was like there's valuable to a balance of both man like like the the books will give you one type of knowledge but the knowledge that you gain through experience is a totally different ball game yeah if i had one frustration that i would share um in regards to training in the seattle area specifically it's not that there are so many reward-based trainers and positive trainers um you know, out there, it is that they do not say, Hey, I can't help your dog, but maybe somebody else can. And here's, yeah. you know, I won't, they don't even have to tell the person who to go to or whatever, but just the notion that your dog can't be helped. Your dog needs to be on drugs. Your dog needs to be rehomed or euthanized because I, with my C P D T K A, I read took an online test and I've trained five dogs can't help your dog or whatever, even the really experienced people. Um, because throwing food at this isn't working. Your dog needs to take a dirt nap. And the, I'm not talking about the biting pit bull serious case kind of situation. I'm talking right, about right. normal dogs that don't need to be on drugs. Um, that just need a little bit of structure and leadership and communication, whatever that looks like. Um, just need a little bit of balance in the relationship. And it's so bad here. I mean, it is every single surrender that we are getting. I've spent thousands. I've spent years. Yeah. I've done everything that you could possibly do for this dog. And it's like, well, have you ever disagreed except with for, your dog's behavior? A leash correction or... No, any, anything. Have you disagreed with your dog's behavior in any shape or form that's meaningful to your dog? you know, and, mm -hmm. and that's just so lacking. Um, and it's really unfortunate and it's hard to dance around. It's hard to have those conversations with people. It's hard to do it without, you know, being shamed for it. Um, it's hard mm -hmm. to, it's hard to help people in this climate. Um, because they're so, trying to think with their emotions. Yep. Yeah, but it's get, apparently it's not emotional or sad to get rid of your dog or to have them on drugs or whatever. So they're, there is a disconnect a, there. A, a shot. You know, and I think, man, what that's the ultimate, dude, is give them the shot. You can't take it back that needle, dude. You can't take it back. And like we, we, we owe it to them, I believe. And that's where I like that's where as a dog trainer, I started um, as a purely positive. But then I started to see the real results of competing motivators within that animal. And um, I saw that this wasn't working. You, you know, weren't right. sexier than a squirrel. What's that? You weren't sexier than a squirrel. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe to my dog, but uh, but yeah, that's it. It's like the dog is like I've had that treat a hundred times, dude. That thing I'm I've just never had. And, with you. Yeah. And if that doesn't work, dip it in melted cheese. You know. Yeah, totally. And then if I not, call it then dog money. Yeah. Dog money, and, dude. You know, it's, it's not just the. I'm not even just talking about the dogs that, you know, are euthanized that really shouldn't have needed to be. I'm talking about dogs whose lives are so small, like dogs who are on drugs, dogs who really can't even go out and about and be normal dogs because they are just so compartmentalized you know, with the training fat and frenzied and frantic and neurotic and just like don't know how to behave in our world. Um because of just a lack of commu effective communication. And it's well, not the lack of, of what a dog is too. The lack of appreciation for the fact that this is an animal that needs leadership, that needs um, a, a two way relationship, two way communication um, to be, to have its needs honored as well, which includes, you know, 
leadership, exercise, mental stimulation, not, uh, you know, like just, and it depends on the dog too. Right. So there's like dogs that have different needs, um, mm -hmm. that like my, I'm talking about my own Doberman who's not having his needs met right now. So he's eating freaking diapers, you know, I mean, yeah, but I, I would have him for that you know maybe i should <laughs> um, but good for you that not just come down on the hammer you know and just and that's where like what we were talking about last week of allowing that behavior to expand that awareness to expand um and, and just being like look i mean you can come down on the hammer in some aspect like set up a, a sting operation or something with that with oh that, i did that like know. three years ago that's why i know he knows not to do it i did the sting operation three years ago when i had my first kid he was eating my underwear and we did the sting operation. We, he, <laughs> we had the camera and the e-collar and we did it all. And so that he knew like, hey, you're not allowed to eat underwear. But, and but he like, knows. burritos are totally different, man. Burritos you're not, are... <laughs> he, trust me, he knows he's not allowed to eat them. There is no doubt in my mind that he absolutely knows that it is not allowed. Yeah, you know, the payoff so I, is greater. You know, yeah. Yeah. I don't, maybe the e-collar needs to come out again. I don't know, but yeah, I also just need to do more fun stuff with him. So there's that too. Um, well, both, I think both yeah, <laughs> I think that, that yeah. the boundaries, but also the, the steam vent too. And then um, I had a dog that came here and um, ate his parents' panties and then proceeded to poop them out in my yard. And then it, three, oh, yeah. it, it peed or it, no, it uh, peed. <laughs> it rained. For like a week straight and my wife was out of town and she came back in town and there's some ladies Chicks underwear, underwear in in yard. Yard. <laughs> and i'm just like i could get people into trouble <laughs> totally so just yeah, that's what no, that made me think of when you said that he was eating my underwear I had oh to... he he would he did that like he'd poop him in the yard or puke him up one or the other i'm like wow. you're gonna have a surgery one of these days he never did i don't know how like, but wow. i mean i was down to like no underwear it was bad Give them um, freaking oils, like castor oil, get all the way through there. Here we got um, experience is what you get after you need it. Well, and look at the word ex expert, right? And experience, right? The, the first one, two, three, four letters, five letters. Yeah, five letters <laughs> are the same, expert and experience, right? And so you better have that expert or experience to be uh, called an expert. I personally have uh, family friends that think it is ridiculous that I invest in dog training, continuous education. Yeah. But it's not for them, man. You keep on doing it, Billy. You keep going. Any, any parting words of advice? How do people find you? Uh, well, we're online. On, we have a website, dogonsale.org. We've got a Facebook and an Instagram and all the, hey, you know, the, whole communication piece of it um Here, we see. do some events in the area we sometimes go to the kraken games and the mariners games um we go to dog friendly places um we're just starting to ramp up events again but yeah, yeah. i'm gonna uh, come i gotta get my hoodie yeah i owe you one we've got like way more colors now too any color of the rainbow pretty much i need to know oh. your address and actually i should just come hand deliver we, we, yeah we need to come we need to meet up anyway and then also i want to do a seminar for fosters and yeah. so fosters how to be a successful foster and if anybody's watching um that does that i know that there are some people that that that's kind of what they uh tailor their training to is fosters um for instance if you're fostering a dog don't let them on your furniture, man. The people that the, that are going to get it might not want to appreciate a dog on the furniture. If you want to have a, the dog to be your dog, let them on the furniture. Like there's certain rules. Like, do you agree, yeah. Jenny? Mm -hmm. like yeah, we share all of those. We we have rules. You know, people sometimes don't follow them. Um, mm -hmm. We have rules around like the structure that people need to provide. I mean, we have to, right? Because otherwise they're not going to be successful. Things are going to go sideways and then in they're in not going to they get worse. You know, the dog the walls or whatever you know yeah. so we have those rules and then if people don't follow them then it's like well we told you not to leave the dog out when you leave the house so you know um or whatever right we we require crate training but hey if you were going to do a seminar because i've talked about this with other people before um i and i think adopters too i mean honestly i want to offer a we're going to be building a facility here and i want to offer a take home rescue dog 101 class and for fosters and for adopters i think we if you could cover in like a two hour time period and it doesn't even have to be with that dog it could be with any dog uh loose leash walking okay. crate 
and threshold manners and place command. Those three things. Arousal people, control as well. I would have to throw in there. Just arousal. I would like to hear like, more about how you would demonstrate that with the, the community. I would love to know because I'll add that to the list too. But those three cool. things, I feel like you can get 90% of things under control if your dog exactly. can. Yeah. What? So what? tell me what you mean by that. I mean, I know what you mean by rascal. Like, like, like people, I don't know where in human world we got dogs being manic is dog being happy. Oh. And like, and like dog laying there being calm and is, is dog being sad. Dude, you You're know sad. it. That dog looks so sad over there. I'm like, who? Which? What are you talking about? <laughs> Look how sad he is. Look how sad he looks. You know exactly what I'm saying. Dude. But to me, that is what we're looking for. Like, that's what I want before we start a walk. That's what I want before we even go out into the dog park. That's what I want. And I want life to be boring sometimes for these dogs. And I want the life to be boring when it's supposed to be exciting. Like, and, and those, those are, are like, the, and we have training gifts that present themselves. And that's what I want people to look at as, as this isn't, isn't something bad. This is actually something good. This is my opportunity. You know, so how do you get at that from like a, here's what you do perspective. Cause like for the other three things, there's some like, techniques to it right you know like absolutely you there are techniques and... well the crate goes hand in hand with it the the, the place yeah. goes hand in hand with it yeah. you know and i call these calming commands and you've seen it like a dogs go in there and what i think happens uh, jenny is that they go in there and at first they're frustrated at first they're stressed or whatever they're and and that's perfectly understandable but i take a thirty thousand foot view of what's happening and right. i know look look i got stressed driving into town like few hours ago so stress is kind of a part of life and it's not what happens to us but how we deal with that right yeah and same thing with this dog is that we can't get in that dog's head and calm them down they have to learn how to calm themselves down and right. that comes through duration and just like experience and it also comes through the acknowledgement and and i also love um casey cover um the name and explain stuff do you know are you familiar with her at all no, but you're just as sounding like what you're talking about, like the messy middle, like that processing of them learning not that they're not doing what they always previously did. And we, I see that. Yeah. Messy middle is huge. Tell me, and that's, tell me about that. Yeah. Casey, Casey, who? Casey Culver. I'll Culver. introduce you. Yeah. She's, she's, um, uh, worked at SeaWorld and stuff, but back, um, and, but she does a name and explain, which I really like, man. And, and, and uh, where she'll also have these seminars where she'll, She'll name and explain the dog's front leg. I'm going to touch your front leg. I'm going to touch your chest, uh, ear, and right ear, left ear. And at first, I thought it was nonsense. But then when I saw some small cues of acknowledgement and nuances of change and, and uh, behavior with that dog, I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I think what happens is, and this kind of is getting out there, but there's Rupert Sheldrake, who is a professor at Oxford University in England, he has coined and uh, the, the the morphogenetic field of influence, right? And there's a thing called the hundredth monkey phenomenon, where once information is kind of disseminated out into the ether, that it's just it's not just picked it's up by the community. right. It becomes now it the known, it. yeah. right? And so I really think that the English and the, the the naming and explaining is for us. But behind the voice is the intention that we throw out on that morphogenetic field. And that's what that dog picks up on. Right. And that's kind of that intent of, hey, I'm going to touch your right paw. I'm going to touch your left ear. I'm going to do this. And I'm gonna, and I, I've, I've just there's something there. And if I had more dogs to do this case study with or more you know, ways that we can apply this to to gain an, a, a bigger knowledge set, I think that we're going to adopt this more and more readily um, just to let dogs um, get more comfortable in the space that they're in and realize that they're in a safe, um, a safe spot that they can start that calming process. Right. Well, two quick things, like, as you mentioned about stress, I think that, you know, you hear that word thrown out a lot, like, well, the dog's stress, like that is like a, something that should be avoided at all costs. Right. I mean, I hear people say that a lot. And mm -hmm. I think that, like you said, um, it's unavoidable. Stress is a natural part of any yes. animal's existence. I'm not sure why that isn't the case for dogs, you know, kind of guiding them, navigating them through that. And people need to understand that. And then what is Rachel says, Rachel says, uh, 
growth doesn't happen in the comfort zone or something along those lines. You better believe it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so like, can we make that part of the human, like, like you're the hundredth monkey of our reality around dogs is like, Hey, we've got to have a little bit of stress here to make, to move the dial. Right. Mm -hmm. And if people could be more comfortable with that, I think I'm not talking about, you know, abuse. I'm talking about just a little bit of stress that might come about as part well, of this learning experience, you know? And I was on Clubhouse with, and, and there was a golden age of Clubhouse where we were having like hundreds of dog trainers in the room and there were purely positives and balance trainers and we were talking. And um, I remember one time I was giving tips to this guy about, he wanted to crate train his dog. His dog was very hesitant to the crate and I wanted to change the, the conversation with that dog towards the crate. And so I had him put some treats, high value treats in the crate and lock the dog out. And so the dog's like wandering around the crate, like how the heck do I get into this crate, right? To build the interest on the inside. And I said, I want you to build a little frustration. I want you to, I want him to pull when you open up that door and I want you to let him go, like, like build up some of that negative reinforcement to get that dog in there to get him really, really loving that. And then I said, you want to frustrate him a little bit. And then a lady came up and she said, why would you ever frustrate a dog? <laughs> Why would you ever? And I was like, so they would learn like frustration builds creativity. That's what I said to her. But then I said it, but I got, she came in really hot and I kind of bounced her to the audience and then it became this whole blow up thing. And then finally Jay Jack came in and um, I, I told him what happened and um, he taught me a better way to communicate with her. And he said, I said, Jay, how would you have handled this situation? I, I, and he said, I would, I would say to her, I'm casting a role in a movie that requires this scene, or the, the scene requires frustration. Can you explain to me what that looks like to you? And it was, um, oh, shoot, we got a lot of comments here. Um, and she, oh, Kinzing is here. Yay. Do you know Kinzing? Yeah, I've, yeah, we, I've met her. And yes, she just moved, and she sent me a whole bunch of uh, dog gear that were super appreciative. Threshold manners are a great example of arousal control. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Not so just... that's what, to go back on that, what you were yeah. saying, arousal control. I feel like arousal control is part of threshold man manners. Arousal control is part of place command, and even leash walking. So, like, it. What I want for like the foster adopter training is like three concrete kind of like skills or protocols where those three skills or protocols, you know, help with arousal control, help with, you know, all the things that are important for having a dog that's successful in your home. Right. And mm -hmm. if you keep it kind of concrete and give like the, the, um, here's the exercise, here's how to teach it. Here's how to reinforce it. Here's how to hold them accountable. Then they have like, follow these instructions, like, as opposed to teaching like concepts that, you know, your average dog owner doesn't know what arousal control means. But oh, they like can understand wait before you go out the door, crate door closes until they're released or don't get off the cot bed. So very specific things that you can pass on. Right. Yep. Yep. And not only that, but just also um, the I think that like having like a temperament test, but almost like a personality test for dogs. Like Joe Silverman had what color is my dog? And I know there's a couple other books that like kind of put, put these dogs kind of in a more like um, like a softer or more reactive or and and sometimes um, he I I don't know if you've had that book. What color is my dog? Are you familiar with it? Mm -mm. Okay, I'll check it out. I'm, I've got a long yeah. list right now. Yeah, but I think that properly categorizing temperaments too, and we not really broadly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We work really hard to do that. We work really hard to be transparent. So like, you're not going to see a description that says like, oh, he um, doesn't like to be left alone if the dog's like got like extreme separation anxiety or, you know, he's mostly good with dog, you know, like we really want to put it out there. And sometimes yeah, the dogs with us here, you know, no, we don't do secret messages. <laughs> no, um, no, no kids, no cats. Yeah. No. <laughs> what I've seen some funny things like he's a great dog. You know, he just needs an, a uh, home where there's no purple in the house and, <laughs> and, and definitely no pants, you know, look at you, your sweatshirt. <laughs> Yeah, no, no guys with hats or beards. I'm like, oh, dang. <laughs> or sunglasses. 
yeah, or yeah. this or that. And that, do you know what it boils down no to? No rooms with four walls. <laughs> well, do you know what dealing with stress is? Is toughening up. You know, toughening well, up to the world. And I think that toughening is a huge aspect that's missing out of relationships with dog. And when I say tough, like you said, like when you say stress, I'm not meaning abuse. Yeah. I'm meaning like, like we toughen it out. We get to the other side of this. We uh, stick through it. Hydrogen peroxide. Next time he eats a diaper, give him hydrogen peroxide. I had a dog who ate socks and was scared of a bowel obstruction. Have you ever like dipped, like give him some Tabasco in that, like left a diaper out there with a the big old thing of Tabasco? I, he would, he yeah. would avoid the Tabasco one. And um, okay. hydrogen peroxide, I, yeah, I know the trick for like the throwing up. I wonder if it ha would have a, 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 punishment effect but you know yeah, a a positive tough one. Punishment. Tried a lot of stuff hey bill to bring this full circle by the way mm -hmm. if i were to tell somebody um you know talk to someone getting into rescue stress would be a very um important part of that conversation like if you don't handle stress well um if stress is some scary and or you like to avoid it like this is not your line of work like you i feel like my everyday you know 30, 40, whatever, there's a lot of fires and you have to be able to kind of go from one to the next um, without getting your panties in a bunch or else you're going to be, your day is going to suck. Every day is going to suck. I mean, there's days that are bad and I'm like, I had a really stressful day and it sucked, but all my days are kind of stressful and you have to kind of be able to like um, still, you know, shake it off, like have be, be there for your person. What do you do to shake it off? Do you, um, uh... You, I mean, you got to schedule vacations for yourself and take some time away. Do you do that? Um, well, like I said, my dad passed away a couple months ago. We were really close. So, so the far, last yes. year, I know, and you too. And it's yeah. just the last year we've spent a lot of time with family because of that. Like knowing that was coming. We've, we've gone out of our way to spend time with family. We went to Hawaii last year. I mean, I used to work out a lot. That was nice. Right now, one of the things I do that helps me is like actually working dogs. Um physically like just keeping <laughs> dogs walk on leash or whatever that that kind of helps me feel better um don't give your pennies <laughs> yeah. into doberman's solid advice I, that's kind of where we're at that's our that's our number one goal with him right now <laughs> oh, well. but, um, that helps or just i don't know i like i like listening to good music um i my kids my especially now he's almost three he's really fun he's at a fun age doing you know going outside and helping him collect slugs. I mean, seriously, I'll do that. I'm just going and just going outside. Like we have a beautiful property that we yeah. were lucky to get a couple of years ago. So just being outside, like, and looking away from, you know, the stuff and just, you know, watching bird, watching the birds, you know, watching the coyotes. I love our coyotes. They come by every day. Our Malinois do not appreciate it, but, uh, did I, I shoot like Adam? I've never, sh I'll never shoot a coyote. I can't, no, dude, but I've no, shot at them. They're minding their own business. Yeah, they're minding their own business. Let them but go. they're pretty bold, dude. They'll walk right up to me, and I'm like, oh, man. And then I have a gun. You know, I'll, I'll let them know that that's not a good idea. But I actually I saw a story it. that one in Sammamish um, last week actually bit a kid in the in the butt. Really? Yeah. A, a coyote? Uh, coyote. I think it must have been rabid because I've never heard of that, but there's Burnout. a video of it. Burnout by, okay, there's a decent book, uh, a Red Kinzine. Rising says there's a decent book I read called Burnout by Emily and Amelia Nag Nagoski. It's a great read on how stress works in the body biologically and how we complete the stress cycle. You know, when my wife was in the hospital, I could not sleep. Yeah. For five freaking days, dude. Like I literally sat there and I'm like, I thought to myself, did I sleep? And I just don't think I slept because I... <laughs> Like, and then you like, get kind of caught in your mind about that and you're yeah. like trying to go to sleep and you can't yeah isn't that crazy and then there's a kinsey's um but for five days man and not only that but it was weird how it affected me and like i did not want like i was a shut-in and i'm so happy that i can do a life where i can you know what i'm not training dogs for a year because i'm going to take care of my wife right or i'm not going to do this because i can and and i'm so freaking thankful that i can take the time for myself and i bought an aquarium shop did you know that i bought an aquarium business i heard that from gina he's she said you know don't don't talk to bill about dogs he's not going to take dogs he's got fish now. <laughs> i love her thank you gina <laughs> with the gina's getting a big hug from me 
I wasn't going to ask you to take any dogs. No, it's all good. No, it's all good. Well, 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 that's so funny. At least not right now. Not right now. Maybe later. (laughs) I'm, and I'm, I will always, I'm always going to do the dog thing. I always will. Like even the glass, the fish, all this stuff is hobbies. The dogs are who I am and, uh, and what I do. And it's just, uh, that pays my soul. But I, but I want to, re- I want to iterate to people. There's life outside of dogs. There's life outside of this business. There's life outside of your rescue, and yeah. there's families. And you don't want to look back and be like, man, I wish I would have spent more time with, with my mom or my dad. Well, you know? and that's a this last year. I mean, I'm really lucky. I've got like, there's people in the rescue that like do a lot of work and are close with me, and they have all stepped up like in the last, you know, like I don't do as much work as I used to do. I used to work like a hundred hours a week, every single week. Oh, I remember dude. Yeah. It's not, it's not that bad anymore. I mean, I still, I still do late nights and I still, whatever, I I still work really hard, but I can also take time off um, to, to be with my family or whatever and just know that it's going to be okay. Um, And that's important. So that's. Thank you everybody who stepped up and is volunteering to help out these dogs, man. It's just like, we hey, can figure this out. What's up? I have one quick question because there's trainers here and I want to know if mm-hmm. anybody's heard of this. So I can't remember where I read it. I can't remember where I heard it, but about um, water uh, dog being a dog, aggressive dog, dog, reactive dog, being in a pool swimming and having the protocol be like there being dogs outside of the pool. Dogs never swam before. Um, so they have to focus on swimming. And if that can be transformative for actually if, uh, how they feel and think about the dogs that are out there. And the reason why I'm asking is because I had a foster dog that was one of the craziest dogs I've ever fostered. She could, she was very dog aggressive and I tried this with her and I felt well, like she it never worked. swam before and, and never then swam before, brought her into the lake, whatever. made her swim while my, while there were multiple dogs that she had never met before around. And we did it several times and I felt like it made it so that I could introduce her to those dogs. Like it, what would have taken weeks took a day. I think so, dude. I think that it, it, it seared um, some neural connections at that new experience, you know, and as that brain was getting rewired, um, she was open to new experiences as well, but it's also such an immersive, like, like the cold, the, the water, the, the movement, um, but some dogs will fight in the water. I mean, so I think that it absolutely is a bridge. I don't know how to explain. Have you done it? Have you done it? I would love to Uh, do like case studies on this. Like I'll supply the crazy dogs. Can we do it? I'd love to do it. Yeah. What we do the swimming with the dog. I mean, it just gives that dog that something else to focus on other than, than those dogs around them. Right. And, um, it takes that mind and, and puts it from that. And a lot of times the, the, the dog is, is self-confidence issues. Yeah. So I see with these reactive dogs, right? It's self-confidence issues. And I compare it to like a dog walking into a prison yard or something like that. Like you walk in and um, you want to kind of be the tough guy. Whoops, hold on. Uh, you, oh. <laughs> Uh, it depends on the intensity and the intent of the dog could work for many, but not all likely. Yeah. I agree with that too. Is there, are, if, there, are there people that have like tried that? Like, I mean, I don't, I honestly can't remember where I first heard yeah. about this, but like. Astrid will volunteer I, Ferris. Yeah. He used to no, do it in my pool. I don't that, anymore. He says it forces oh. them to focus on survival in the water. Exactly. Convinced. Yeah. Well, right. I just had, I had that, the, the dog I'm talking about, her name was Bridget. She's a total nut job, like total nut job. She, like it was remarkable. Like I just felt like she got out of the water and then it's like the dogs weren't an issue to her. And it wasn't like it just was while she was in the water. It also lasted like after she got out of the water and well, the coldness too on her. Right. And that being wet and yeah, I don't know. I just thought, wow, well, that could be something that what if it was like, you know, <laughs> good idea good acting therapy, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I it's got my mind going. Yeah. You know, and well, I, uh, I'd love to, I'd love to, to learn more about that. But if anybody's anyway. watching, like put in the comments, what you think, dude. And, and um, yeah. And if you have experience with this, but yeah, I think that, yeah, it gives a dog something else to focus on. It gives them that survival to focus on, but also it's not for every dog. Some dogs might, it might even shut them down further or was it, it wasn't a shutdown. Was it more of a, 
was it a shutdown kind of like avoidance type of situation with the other dogs afterwards or was it like no. i'm here you're here we're cool no everything. it wasn't she was actually she wasn't even worried about them and she wasn't shut down she it, this was a dog that could get into i mean i she could get integrated with other dogs but her first thing was explosive and she would attack and it wasn't just like mm -hmm. a she wasn't actually insecure she's more dominant and so but once she was comfortable around other dogs, she was fine. You know, um, it what wasn't. Kind of dog was it a mal or a boxer, pit bull, um, German uh, shepherd mix? Okay. Really special mix. Um, <laughs> she was, she, I had her for like two years or something. But anyway. Um, well, and boxers, pit bull are um, the swimming aspect. And those dogs are not as, 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 as welcoming, I don't think, um, as, as it would be with, um, Oh, she was she was working to have to swim. Like it didn't come like naturally. Natural, right. You I know how some like dogs or anything, but yeah, she was definitely like, like whoa, yeah. like this is. I remember I had a rescue and I brought him to uh, a river, and he he thought it was like um a gray field, because he just took off running like he was gonna run on top of that water, and he went but boom, <laughs> and then he came up dude, 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 like, oh my gosh, and but he was okay. But yeah, it, I I don't those dogs aren't the best swimmers. Okay. I agree with it. Making neural pathways, which open up new opportunities and many layers to that approach could be for some uh, and detrimental to stressful for others. Yeah. It could be a very overwhelming, a divided attention, a priority saying, yep. Yeah. Divided that makes sense. Priority. I mean, I think, I think it's Survival. just really, I just think it's really interesting. Um, and yeah, it just, I wanted to ask since there's other people that, yeah. Cause I just have that one experience with it and I would just thought, wow, that's, pretty cool keep it up man see if it sticks see if it if it holds true or <laughs> i'm trying try not to have any more bridges in my life right now yeah me neither yeah i've got enough i got <sighs> enough crazies here i've got, I've you, got a new, you got a little baby too man i got two babies and i got a german shepherd malinois that i've had since uh october and i've got another got foster a, and i don't right. want any boxer pit bull shepherd dog attackers right now diaper doby yeah i got my diaper doby <laughs> got my whiny shepherd mando yeah we're good on that one but Indeed. i'll be happy to like you know volunteer my... handlers that's yeah. a good one too yeah the trust in the handlers i mean the handler just like we were speaking about earlier the dog the the trust is a cornerstone to all these relationships and and the dog is um kind of defaulting to the handler there it could break, tr break trust if they're overwhelmed absolutely she was, she, we were good. She and I were good. And she knew, I think, I don't think she was totally free. Like, I don't think she was totally overwhelmed. Like I was right there with her, um, like in the lake with her. Um, I wasn't going to let her like sink or anything, but I just wanted to, yeah, I don't know. I, I just thought it was so interesting. Cause there were like four or five other dogs there too. It wasn't like it was, um, you know, it wasn't just one new dog that was around. There were multiple new dogs that were around at that time. And, um, and I went and had her on a long line. And so I was, and those, these are dogs that mind their own business. They're not going to come up to a dog, you know, okay. that they don't know. Um, but it, but you know, when Bridget has a problem with another dog. Mm -hmm. And so when we got out of the water and she was like, I don't have a problem with these dogs. Like that's like, was unheard of for her. Um, that's, that was totally unheard of for her. Yeah. I'd love to watch yeah. the video footage of it. That's what I would do is start videotaping it or just having somebody with you. You know, yeah. anybody want to volunteer as a cameraman, you know, you get a good, yeah. you get a hoodie, you get a, <laughs> okay, I'll volunteer. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go there. <laughs> um, but yeah, and that's, what's good about sharing your observations and just be like, huh, man, you know, we do the tunnel of love, John and Sparks and I, and, and, um, and Dave does a lot of trainers practice the tunnel of love where we all actually take and, and tie out dogs besides and then walk the dog between it to make them pay attention or, or just show them hey look even though we have all these distractions um you still have to pay attention to the handler isn't and, that like for required for graduation mm -hmm. yeah there are standards that are That's required man and i think the standards are a good thing and i think that a lot of dog trainers don't have standards yeah, they they, they the dog as long as the dog's just like being <laughs> Or I don't know, just like the dog is being cool. I got a dog over here just sitting there being cool. I guess he's. Full I still on. remember. I think the first time that I 
well, I, I took a foster dog back when I was working with another rescue. So this is like seven years ago to Sparks because I heard that he was like the only person that could help with like, I, and it was a chow pit bull shepherd mix. Mm-hmm. And I'd had him for like six months. I didn't know anything. I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, you know, had him on a gentle leader and was just like trying to give him food, make him stop wanting to bite everybody but me. Um, and uh, he and so I started the program with Sparks and I got my homework and I was doing the, you know, the squares and the choke oh, chain no, 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 no. and this and that and in the yard. And then um, he was good with me. Like he would do that with me. I thought I did my homework well. You know, I thought I had prepared him and we get there and, you know, Sarge was a total shit show. He wouldn't do it because there was a man that he didn't know standing nearby and uh, he wouldn't do it. And I think Sarge was like, yeah, oh, he was bad, stranger danger. And I think he was like, well, you got to do your homework. You got you to gotta be better. You got to do more, put more time in. This goes back to what you're saying about trainers holding people accountable. And I was just like, oh, okay. Like, I don't even remember how I felt or acted. I just remember knowing that I just didn't know what I, I was so over my head. Like I was so over my head with that dog. Um, and, but I mean, I figured it out. It took me several more months and, and it was, it was tough tough going but yeah it just goes to show you like you don't yeah i don't know that was it's a hard thing I to let i didn't know anything and i thought okay he'll do it for me in this like sterile yard environment so we're good like on to the next one we definitely weren't ready for tunnel of love <laughs> yeah <laughs> really well and that's, we love and as trainers that's our our uh, job too to get our, our um students there but we also have to realize how do we fix it or how do we help people that might not be there? Right. And uh, whether it, if, if it's, if they're not doing the the work or if they are doing the work, but it's just not translating. Um, they and think I, they're doing the work, but they don't really know exactly. They're not, what they're not at all doing the work. <laughs> like, no, yeah. I did it. I did it. Like, well, clearly you did it. <laughs> well, but it's also remember easy to, or it's also important, I should say, to remember. I mean, it's easy for us trainers to get down on, on people, especially if we do it all the time and we want these expectations and we, we're getting frustrated. But it's also it's, it's important to remember that these people are showing up. Yeah. They don't have to, dude. They don't have to, but they're showing up because that they want to gain this knowledge and and they know when they're behind. You know, and sometimes it just takes that just experience of being in that space to kind of motivate them a little bit more, right? So, I mean, I I I'm all for holding people accountable, but also know that people have big lives and and sometimes uh Sometimes they need a little bit more patience, just like some of these dogs. They need a little bit more patience as well. John's the best at holding people accountable. John's well, you know, and I man. can't do that. I don't get to do that in my position because when I'm working with people, they are literally like volunteers. Right. And if you alienate them or you make them feel bad or you feel like whatever, any of that, just forget it. Say goodbye. They're not fostering for you again. They're not going to work with it. I mean, you just and ironically, like you're paying someone to hold you accountable. I mean, like you'd think that the trainer would have to, you know, kowtow to the client, but no, you're paying to have someone. Yes, make them, absolutely. Yes. So I'm not all- saying don't do it. I'm not saying go yeah. back and be and coddle them or anything. I'm yeah. saying we're moving forward with this class. Yeah. You are behind. Yeah. And, but we're still moving forward with this teaching. You still have not just last week now, but this week as well. So we, uh, and I, I wish you luck. I know you can do it and I encourage them, you know, but yeah. I know that it's, and I also let them know, look, this will pay you dividends. This will be worth it. Um, but it does take the work and there's no way around it. There's no way over it, no way under it. You have to go through it, you know, but yeah. the best way that we can communicate, uh, effective communication, cooperation, um, you know, and that's why I love John. That's why I love all the trainers and, uh, Kinzing and, and, you know, all, all around the world, man, I talk to people because I think that we all have something to learn from each other and something to teach each other. And, um, but I, and I'm a no nonsense guy too. Like, and I know sometimes that there's some people that I have to be no nonsense with and they appreciate it because they are paying me to be no nonsense. Um, but it's, it's, it just takes that, I don't know, that experience to recognize that. Yeah. And know, know who you can press a little bit more. Well, my fifth grade teacher who loved me 
told my parents that I did not suffer the fools and that I could be abrasive. And my mom reminded me of that, like my whole life, um, you know, still does. So I work on that. You can like, be abrasive, Jenny. Yeah, I can. <laughs> I can. I try. I'm, I've been working on it. Like, uh, seriously, especially like since my 30s, I've been working on it. Um, and it's like important, you know, if you want people to like give their time to you and things like that, that you kind of. Yeah. So anyway, personal growth opportunity. But 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 also sometimes you just have to tell it like it is, you know, there's only so much time in the day. You know, I don't know. That's 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 where how I really feel. And then I'm like, wait, the good angel over here is like. Be nice. Be nice Take to them. Time. Smile. Yeah. Smile. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Don't be abrasive. <laughs> When's your birthday? December third. Winter was. You're a Sagittarius, dude, and you're abrasive. What? I don't do that stuff. I don't do that stuff. <laughs> there you go. I don't do that stuff. No, I mean I don't even know. Like I couldn't even name all. You're of the a signs. Sagittarius. You're a bouncy <laughs> ball. <laughs> you're um what do they call that a half man half um with the archer the centaur or whatever i don't know but you're good you're not abrasive at all i don't think so i've met you and yeah so. i mean it's all good everyone has their own personalities just like dogs are just you know you have to kind of i, I kind of have to <laughs> like more to do with your higher awareness sign. right not your sun sign <laughs> Oh God, you guys! You guys are like <laughs> centaur. What's my sign? My birthday is November twenty second. I am on the cusp of Scorpio Sagittarius eleven twenty two one one two two. I mean, so how can you just really feel like anybody that was born in the same like what four week period as you has like that personality? That just seems. Silly. I don't know that, but they say that you know what millionaires they don't believe in astrology. Billionaires do. <laughs> because they, they base all their business meetings like leave nancy reagan had this like there's a people that are hardcore into it and um i don't know so who knows well i you know i got more years on this earth so maybe <laughs> maybe there's a place for some exploration of that in my yeah. free time yeah there you go How, well, yeah well, um, I look forward to, you know, talking to you a bit further about doing some seminars and um, doing some events now that the the world is opening up. And uh, what does Kenzine say? I think it's more like having tendency, not exact personalities. What is she talking about? Oh, the, the horoscope. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, dude, what, what the hell is she talking about? And we got a, a skull. It's is John's birthday. Friend? Happy yeah. birthday, John. Happy birthday. I'm gonna give him your I'm gonna give you your spankings. <laughs> I'm gonna drive over to Monroe as soon as I hang up. I'm gonna find you, John. <laughs> He's probably like 50, so I have to give him like 50. Warm up my hand here. All right. Well, thanks so, for having me on. Thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate you. I appreciate what you do. I know that it's hard work. And I like how um how you handle stress. Uh, I, you're like, you haven't seen how I handle stress. Jill. <laughs> <laughs> you, have my, you have to also ask my husband about that. I'm actually, <laughs> I've literally locked myself in the bedroom for this call and like put the double locks on the door. So. 53. He's 53 years old. Happy birthday, buddy. We love you. <laughs> Don't tease me. My gosh. All right. Well, go have, go find your, your husband. Kids, they're not hard to find. I just follow the sound of chaos. Oh, the sound and yeah, the crashing noises and yeah, oh exactly. wait, we got some wine. People are saying wine. That yeah, that's good. Yeah, that helps. Is, is it five? Yeah, we're we're like almost six o'clock. You now. know what I say? Um, Why drink and drive when you can smoke and fly? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Billy. Yeah, I don't drink. But I, but I smoke like a chimney, so. Well, I definitely, you know, being pregnant kind of changes your perspective on that whole drinking thing for sure. Of course. <laughs> Changing your perspective and uh, your habits. Um, and also like a lot more productive, you know, not drinking. So there's that, it's, you know, like everything else has got to be a balance. It has to be a good balance. 
I don't remember last time I had a drink. I drink a lot of or, coffee every day. I you that you were pregnant. I don't remember last time I was pregnant either. Yeah. I remember last <laughs> time I felt pregnant with Moose Moose Creek barbecue. <laughs> you like, don't? Did you say you don't drink coffee? No, I drink coffee every day. Oh, okay. Because I could not live like without a madman. So yeah. coffee is the second largest commodity traded on the face of the earth behind petroleum. Yeah, I was recently told to stop drinking coffee because um, my baby. Uh, Whoever told you that, do not trust, trust them. I know. And I was like, no, that's not an option. I'm sorry. Like, that would be like saying you could sleep outside for the all of December or something. Like, it's just not happening. It's not not an option. So let's discuss other options. <laughs> yeah, I love my coffee. But it's too good now. Well, um, it, and then so doggone Seattle rescue dot com. Is that it? Dot org. Hold on, let me get it on here. Doggonseattle.org. Dog, hold on. Dog gone. Two G's. Mm -hmm. .org. And then let's see. Save. Hold on, I'm trying to do the scroller. And then here it goes. Ticker. Hey. There it is. That's it. So you guys, 5031C, tax deductible donations are always welcome. Doggone Seattle.org. More so, more so. Uh, what, do we, what do you need? What do you need? Fosters that like know their way around, a, you know, just a, a crate or a leash. Like anyone that, you know, like we're, we get these foster apps from people that have never owned a dog before in an apartment with two cats. And I'm like, no, you're not going to have a good time with this. You know, like you have to have some kind of. So anyway, Fosters. Have a dog. you don't have to be an expert, but, you know, just know your way around a leash and, and can provide structure and follow instructions. And if you get in deep water, or you need help. We're there and you know, we'll, we will hold your hand, but fosters four week commitment, no financial commitment. I mean, in four weeks, average, um, no financial commitment. The average. <laughs> hey, be. well, if you get a Bridget, it's like three years, but you know, and, and we welcome foster failures too. Those, the Bridget's end up at my house. So and they, do people know what foster Gina's, failures are? Or Gina's. I think Bridget might have stayed with Gina for a bit. I can't remember. She probably did. Did I meet her? I don't think I met her. Maybe. Okay. You remember crazy. I would say DGS probably has the most detailed how, how to fail as a foster itinerary out there. What does that mean? How to fail? Oh, uh, like we, she's talking about like our roadmap for success. Like it's literally like, don't do this. Don't do that. Like don't, oh, do, don't okay. put the dog on the couch. Don't let the dog yeah. in your bed. Da, 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 da. Here's your schedule. Like we really yeah. like. You're not you nurturing. This... You're going to be successful. Yeah. The structure is key. Yeah. Structure, not nurturing. Like you're going to like, like you're going to love, I'm sure, and, and develop a relationship with this animal, but you are a transitive energy here and you need to respect that you are just kind of uh, bringing the dog to their forever home unless you want to become that forever home. Yeah. And then you can do whatever you want. You want to go dog parks? Fine. But no dog parks. Like while we're, that's a rule. I mean, we have rules too, you know, and it's yeah. like, you explain it like kids, like, Hey, if you were fostering a kid that's like been in juvie or something and you're taking them into your home, what are you going to be like, here's your room. Here's the keys to the car. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and have a party, do whatever you want. You know, like that's not. And then and get mad at them when they wreck your car. Right. right exactly. Like... We don't know these dogs history. So like you got to respect what, and that's kind of, you know, where our motto comes from. It's not meant to be cheesy. There, There is meaning behind it. Rescue, respect, repeat. Like, you need to respect that these are animals, that we don't know their histories, that they have certain needs that we need to provide, and one of them is leadership, and that, um, you know, it's a predator, as you said. So, like, we got to also be smart about how we do things. I, I don't want – we've never been sued, you know, so <laughs> I like to keep it that way. Um, and so there's, like – responsibility involved and it's not just hey put this dog in belltown with three cats and you got a wonder walker harness on it and there we go whatever so rescue res respect and repeat that's it i like it awesome jenny well thank you very much you guys check out dongonseattle.org and um and an answer below, if you guys think about the water thing, what if you guys have had any experience or what your what your thoughts of that are? And um, yeah, you stay there, our Jenny. Foster applications on our website. And then what the foster applications are on the website. So if you guys foster want to foster in the Pacific Northwest here, are you only in the Pacific Northwest here? 
we got a few people like down in Vancouver and like, uh, you know, but yes, Western Washington, Western Washington. Okay. Down in Vancouver, up in Bellingham, up, up and down the I-5 corridor. That's pretty much, you know, you got to be within a couple hours. You got to be able to get to Seattle if you have to. Right. Okay. So. Awesome. Stay there. And I will say goodbye to you uh, in the studio. Okay, Jenny. Okay. And then everybody else. Thank you. We'll see you later. Goodbye.